I am not in the pulpit today. I preached over at our fellowship hall where we shared a meal, and uh, it wasn't conducive to recording. And so instead, I'm going to do this. We'll try to do a chat from my office, which is interestingly fitting to begin uh, with today because we're talking about someone else who is famous for his fireside chats, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. As you look across history and you ask, who are the great leaders? FDR is one of the ones that would, would potentially come to mind. And, and if I was to ask folks, what, what did FDR do? What made him a great leader? What you could hear, what you could say would be something like he was the person who led us out of the Great Depression. He led us through World War II, working well with Churchill, and died while serving in office. You could say that, and that would all be true, but it would be glossing over and simplifying to the point where it can give a false impression about what it means for him to be a great leader. Because what happens if you simplify things that much is that it gives the impression that when FDR got into office that he just had a, a map. He had everything laid out and everything planned, and he was just he had it all worked out ahead of time, knew how everything was going to happen. And that is not the case. What made him a great leader was not that he had a map. And I want to look at what made him a great leader. So let's take a little bit closer look at FDR. FDR goes into office in 1933. And he begins in his first 100 days. He's the one who begins the, the sort of modern political uh, question. What are you going to do in your first 100 days? Because he took that first 100 days and he ran. He started passing a plethora of federal agencies, creating them. He creates the WPA, uh, Works Progress Administration, hires people to get them back to work. He does banking reform. He does the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps. He passes the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Agency, the NRA, which is not what you think it is today. The NRA then was the National Recovery Agency. He ends prohibition, begins rural electrification, starts Social Security, passes the NLRA, the National Labor Relations Act, which strengthens uh, the power of the unions, which leads to the passage of a lot of minimum wage laws. And, and so in retrospect, it looks like he does a lot of these things and it just starts as a, co a coherent plan. But what it really was, was the political equivalent of throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what stuck to see what would work, to see what would bear fruit. Because he also was dealing with another dynamic. He was dealing with uh, problems he was having with the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court was striking down a lot of his, uh, the laws he was having passed as part of the, of the great, the, the New Deal, the New Deal and the Second New Deal. His uh, NRA, the National Re Re Recovery uh, Agency that oversaw ever, the whole situation, and the AAA, which was working with the farmers, was struck down as unconstitutional. And if you don't have someone organizing and you don't have the farmers uh, taken care of, you don't have much. And so what happens in his second term is it becomes very clear Here's what that... Here's It becomes clear that this was non-scripted. What becomes very clear in the second term is that he is working it out as he goes because he, he takes his foot off the gas. He kind of backs off pushing so hard for recovery. And in 1937, 38, at the beginning of the second term, the nation face plants economically again. There is a, another great uh, recession. And, and it's not like you can turn on a dime as you're leading the economy of a nation. It takes a while. And so what happens is he has to ramp back up and it, it takes a bit. And, and further, this is also the time where he sees all of the problems he's having with the Supreme Court. And so he attempts to uh, stack the, the bench, so is what the term was. He argues that for everyone, for every judge over 70, this president should be able to appoint another judge. Uh, so if you have nine judges and two of them are over 70 years old, then the current president needs to appoint two more judges so you'd have 11 judges up to a max of 15 total judges because you know once you get over 70 you know this kind of slow down and you need people with sharp minds on the court and, and as you might guess that argument 
does not go over well. And, and it becomes a fervor and a fury over this that, that is really pretty amazing if you look back upon it. It, it backfires. It does, isn't passed. One of FDR, one of his biographies, biographers, a fellow by the name of James Burns, suggests that Roosevelt's policy was like that of a general in a fighting a guerrilla war who like marshals his forces and sends them out to do multiple things. And, and if, if, it, if they work out, so they're all back together on the other side of the mountain, that's just as much luck as it is skill. And, and I think that lines up with FDR's understanding of what he was doing. What he wrote, wrote of his own efforts was that the country, country needs, and unless I mistake its temper, the country demands bold, persistent experimentation. It is common sense to make a method and try it. If it fails, admit it frankly and try another. But above all, try something. And this, this sense of humility, the, the humility to admit, yeah, I could be wrong, but I'm going to be bold and try something. This, this seems to me to be the core of what makes FDR a great leader. And, and we could take how he handles World War II and spin this out a little bit further, but I think the, the, the line of thought is the same, that uh, World War II is not just as simple like, we were neutral, Japan bombs Pearl, Pearl Harbor, D-Day, atomic bomb on Japan, and everything's everything's done. Eh, no, that's... That's, it makes it too simple. It is more complicated than that. What make F, made FDR this great leader it is not that he had a map. Everything laid out in one clean plan and it had taken account to everything. That, that's not real. That's not what happens. And what not true to how he understood what he was doing. What made FDR a great leader was not that he had a map, but that he had a compass. He had a clear sense of this is where we're going. And we're going towards this understanding of what America should be. And we can disagree about whether FDR's understanding of what America should be is the right one or the, a good one. I mean, that's a whole other topic. But, but to say that that was his compass, and that's what he kept on coming back to again and again. That's what made him a great leader that we look back to today. As a church, during this time of Lent, we have been thinking about uh, this journey the Hebrew people took towards the promised land. And last week, having looked at how does a people leave its past behind and, and move towards a better future, and then use the story of Joseph as an example of what it looks like for one person to do that, uh, today we are looking at the leadership that makes such a journey possible. And we're going to look at Moses. And Moses, like FDR, is an amazing leader. And like FDR, you can simplify his life down to, you know, Moses, he was raised a prince, spent some time as a shepherd, leads the people through the wilderness, and done, right? This is great. He teaches, gives them the Ten Commandments. We're great. Um, but that would be, again, making it seem like Moses had it all figured out, had it all worked out ahead of time, and that really is not the case. If we look at Moses' story more closely, what happened in his life, we would see that Moses begins life being raised as an Egyptian prince. And as an Egyptian prince, he would have learned to solve problems the way an Egyptian uh, monarchy solves problems. They use violence, they use force. And so when uh, Moses comes across a guard who is beating a Hebrew slave, he kills that guard. That, that's what he's been trained to do. That's what he's seen his family do. And so uh, he does that, and then that is found out, and he has to run. He has to flee. He flees and he goes into the wilderness and he becomes a shepherd. And let's just stop to acknowledge everything he leaves behind. He leaves behind writing. Like in Egypt, they were writing. They had papyrus. They had a whole culture that was based on the written word. And he goes out in the wilderness and it's not there. It, it doesn't, it's not there yet, right? And so he leaves behind writing. He leaves behind servants. He had servants as a prince that would make sure he was fed, make sure his head closed. He didn't have to worry about any of that. And now he's in the wilderness. And if he doesn't do it, doesn't take care of it, he's not going to have what he needs. He is going to go from be, having the security of being in the royal family. If, if you think about who is the last person to go without or the last family to go without when there's a problem, it's the royal family, Pharaoh's family. And now he's a shepherd. And if there's a problem and he messes up, he's going to go without. 
And so all of this like builds up. He has an entire lifestyle that is back there and it's gone. Like he has walked away from this entire lifestyle and he has to learn to be a shepherd. And so that's what happens. He marries a, a someone, a Zipporah, and he has children and he learns to be a shepherd. And instead of leading people to war, he leads flocks to pasture and, and to find water. And he, he has this new life. And decades into this new life, he is called to go back to Egypt. And so he goes back to Egypt. God calls him to go back to Egypt and grab my people, guide them to freedom. And he knows he needs help, so he takes Aaron with him. So he knows he needs help with an act of humility and honesty, which is appreciated. And then now he's going to lead the people. And it's another drastic change of life. Think about how often he would hear people talking as a shepherd. Like he could spend all day with the sheep and no one would talk to him and he would have just silence. And think about how often people were talking to him as he's leading thousands of people across the desert. Like how long do you think it took Moses before he looked around and thought to himself, I miss my sheep, right? How long do you think that took him? A day, a week? Like, I don't know. But you think of all, again, all the changes it goes to. He, he had gotten used to being a shepherd. He had years and years and years of experience being a shepherd. And now he's going to lead people. And he's gone from the biggest challenges being good pasture, good water, and, and, and keeping track of wild animals that would eat a sheep. Now he has to deal with the, the demands of an entire people who are learning what it means to live by uh, God's plan, God's teaching. And, and so now he, he has this another uh, change this other shift and he doesn't know how uh, he goes from knowing the land he is on and knowing it well because he's been on the same pasture land for years and now he doesn't know what's over the horizon and that's where he's going he's going to lead these people over the horizon again and again and again and whenever they're scared they're going to come to him and they're going to complain and he's going to miss his sheep what makes moses a great leader in this moment is not that he had a map because he didn't, like he didn't have a plan, a clean, sort of everything's worked out and we're going to do this and this and this and this and this and this is how it's going to work out. He doesn't have a map. What he has is a compass. He has a compass and, and it's the best compass you can have because it's he's going to turn to God and he's going to say, help. He's going to turn to God and he's going to say, help again and again and again and again. This is the pattern we see in the latter half of Exodus and into Numbers as the story of the journey of the people across the promised land. What we, we see is this pattern of the people come to Moses and the, they complain. But right after Miriam sings the song of, of we have gotten across the Sea of Reeds, the Red Sea, and, and within the next the next place they, they camp, like the first, second time they camp any, anywhere, they stop for the night, the people are complaining. And so uh, this this pattern develops people complain and moses says i don't know let me go to god like again and again people complain and moses says i don't know i'll go to god get it figured out and bring it back to you and, and this is the way that the excuse me the hebrew people are taught is they're taught contextually over time they're going to go a little bit further and we will oh we got we have to struggle with this moses what should we do and moses will say i don't know let's go to god and, and then he'd bring back this uh, learning that they would need, this another bit of Torah, the, the bit of Torah, the bit of teaching they would need for that moment in, in that time. And, and so this is Moses' role. What makes him this leader is not that he has a map, but that he has a compass, and his compass is he's going to turn to God and he's going to ask for help. He's going to ask for guidance again and again and again. And Moses had one thing going for him that no one else did. If you think about the entire group of people, Moses is leading this entire people across the the, the wilderness, and all of them have various skills, but no one no one of them has the one thing that Moses had. And the one thing that Moses had was he had done this before. He had gone from being the prince of Egypt, and he'd left it all behind to become the shepherd, and God had gotten him through that. And because he'd, been, he'd trusted God to get him through that, he knew that he could trust God to get him through this next thing. Even though this next thing was going to be wildly different than anything that he had been as a shepherd or anything he'd been as a prince, it was still, it was, 
Moses was not leaning upon uh, his own understanding. What Le Moses was leaning on was he has a compass, and that compass was something that had gotten him through before, and it could get him through again. And, and so that's all the other people are complaining. We can't blame them, really. They're scared. They're entering new things. They don't. They haven't built up this trust in this compass that that Moses does have, because Moses has done this once before. He has walked away from an entire life, and found a new life, and now he's doing it again, and leading the whole people and doing it. All right. It uh, strikes me uh, as as I was doing research for this sermon, I came across an article by the Harvard Business Review that that correlates to this, and it was striking how similar it was. The Harvard Business Review in their studies of leadership pointed out that the quickest way to tell if you have a bad leader is to ask, is a leader absolutely certain of, of their plan, that their plan, this is the plan, this is the thing that's going to make it all work, and, and is that leader uh, think that they are above the rest, like, I am the best person, I understand everything, and here's the plan, and everything's going to work out. And if they have that, then uh, that is a quick and surefire way to find out if you have a bad leader. And there's a little test you can take that goes with it, which I took, because why not? And it, at the end of it, told me, you know, Andy, you're not a bad leader, which is an interesting thing to say, because it didn't say you're a good leader. It just said, well, you're not a bad leader. Well, okay, better than nothing. But that, that gets at what uh, both FDR and, and uh, Moses had. There was a humility. We're going to try new things. And I don't have it all figured out, but here we go. I've got this compass to guide. I think uh, this helps us think through what it means to be a church on a journey, because as a church, we are always on a journey. We don't know what the next day will come. And I set up to write this sermon like two months ago, and I did had no clue that statement would be quite so accurate today, that we don't know what the next week will bring. We really don't. We're on this journey, uh, so we don't have a map. We can't ask uh, our leaders to have a map. If we demand that our leaders have a map, we're asking too much. It's not possible. What we can ask is that leaders have a compass, that they have a clear sense. This is what I'm being guided by. I'm not quite sure what's going to be between here and there, but I know this is where I'm going. I'm heading, in the case of the church, I'm heading towards what Jesus calls us to do. We're looking at what Jesus prioritizes. And so... That's true for us today. And, and I think uh, the two uh, phrases, the two people who have used this phrase, phrases that help me sort of flesh this out and understand this, uh, there's a fellow by the name of a Reverend Bolsinger who talks about this leadership process, like leadership like Moses, leadership in the church. He describes, this Reverend Bolsinger describes it as disappointing people at the rate they can handle. And that's what Moses did. Moses disappointed people at a rate they could handle. Because how often do you think that Moses was asked that question that we ask whenever we're on a journey? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we, when are we getting to the promised land? Are we, have we learned everything? And Moses had to say to people, uh, we have a little bit more to learn. We're going to get there. Let's get through the day. I mean, Moses had to disappoint people. We're not to the promised land yet, and we're not getting there tomorrow. But he had to disappoint them in a way that, they could still hold on to where they were going, because if if there were if you, Moses was always going to be able to make them keep them happy, then that's not leadership. That's getting comfortable. Uh, and the other phrase that helps I think helps us can help us understand this is uh, the rather blunt phrase from our current bishop, Bishop Bob Barr, uh, Bishop of the Methodist Church in Missouri. And the way he puts it is, if, if you're good, if you lead, you're going to bleed that there's no way to extricate those two. If you're going to lead, you're, you're going to bleed because we are, any leader is going to say uh, things that are true. I don't know what we need to do. This is, this is a challenge. Can, can you help me work through this? Like that, and that's not what we want leaders to say. We want leaders to either pretend like they have it all under control and they don't, or we want to pr have leaders to have this sense of they, they, they know everything that's going to happen and they don't. Right. And so to say, I don't know, we're going to have to work that out. I mean, that, that's not going to make everyone happy. And if you're going to lead, you're going to catch flack. If you're going to lead, you're going to bleed. Like the, tr and the truth of it, it is true, right? We're heading towards God, the kingdom of God. We're not there yet. That's disappointing. And, and if you give, I mean, you give flack, we want good news. We want to hold on to something right now. 
And so it is my understanding, as we look at the life of, of Moses, we look, read scripture, that when we're looking at leaders in the church, if we're looking at amazing leaders, we're looking at great leadership, what we're looking for is not someone who claims to have it all figured out, who, who has a map and has everything lined up and is going to A, B, C, everything's going to work out just this, just so. I don't think that's that's what we have. I think a, a leader, in, in the, according to Scripture, a great leader in the church has a compass, and that compass points them towards Jesus and, and, and is able to say to all of us who follow that leader, is able to say, we're heading towards Jesus. That's our compass. We're going to just keep on coming back and asking that question. Well, what is Jesus concerned about? What does Jesus care about? And as we keep on following this compass, uh, what, it will guide us back, will back, guide us towards uh, what we value. It guides us towards uh, Jesus and the kingdom that is to come. And we're not going to get there today, and I'm not sure about tomorrow, but in the end, this is our compass. If we follow it, it will lead us where we need to go. Amen.